Hi, I'm in Christchurch on the South Island of New Zealand and today we're travelling on one of the world's great railway journeys, the Transalpine. This will take us across New Zealand's Southern Alps. It's promising some spectacular scenery, so let's go. In today's journey, we'll join the hordes wanting a coffee fix, check out the scenic class carriages, follow a spectacular river gorge, cross towering viaducts, see the Southern Alps topped with snow, admire the sights from the open air viewing car, learn how building this treacherous line sent one company broke, see how locals enjoy the region's largest lake before reaching our destination on the west coast. We start our journey in the South Island's biggest city, Christchurch. The railway station is located on the southwestern edge of the CBD, just over three kilometres from the city centre. The current station opened in 1993. Let's head inside. Even though you can buy your tickets online and regardless of whether you have luggage, you still need to check in with a staff member on the day of travel. The Transalpine is the most popular tourist train in New Zealand. Staff will issue you a boarding pass with your seat allocation and tag your luggage. You'll then head out to the platform and take your luggage to the luggage car at the rear of the train. You can take a checked bag weighing up to 23 kilograms. You can also take additional bags for a fee. Here's where the luggage goes. You can take this trip as a day tour, returning to Christchurch this evening, either on the train or as part of a coach tour from Arthur's Pass with different stops along the way. Here's our motive power, two DX class locos. Boarding begins 25 minutes before departure. The carriages feature large panoramic windows. They're the same type of carriages you'll find on the Northern Explorer and Coastal Pacific trains. Let's step aboard. That way is the accessible toilet and the cafe. Good morning ladies and gentlemen, Atamari, a warm welcome on board the Transalpine today bound for Arthur's Pass, Moana and Greymouth. There are 236 passengers on today's service. The train can accommodate up to 315 passengers. Here's my seat. Now folks, if I could have your attention please, uh, if you put any heavy bags on that rack above your seat, now's a really good time to move them down. The overhead racks are not designed for heavy items. There's a large tray table. A seat back pocket where you'll find the menu. USB charging ports are down here. And legroom is decent. You'll be provided a headset for the GPS triggered audio commentary. And these are the volume and channel controls for the audio system, which is available in English and Mandarin. The crew advises us that the cafe is open but short staffed because of COVID-19. So the queue is quite long. It seems everyone had the same idea of getting breakfast and a coffee on the train. We depart on schedule. Today's train comprises an open air viewing car which also contains a generator, five passenger cars, a cafe car and a luggage car. Most of the carriages were built between 2010 and 2012 in Dunedin. 
Because I haven't had breakfast, I decide to see if the queue for the cafe is any shorter. Marginally. There's a map on the overhead screens to track the train's progress. So while we wait, let's take a look at our route. We'll start by crossing the Canterbury Plains as we make our way out of Christchurch before entering the Southern Alps on our way to Arthur's Pass. From here, we'll enter a long tunnel that marks the transition from Canterbury to the West Coast. We'll follow a series of river valleys to the town of Greymouth. In the distance, we can see a plane on approach for Christchurch Airport. You don't have to travel far to see sheep in New Zealand. We're on schedule at our first stop, Rolleston, where we pick up passengers. Rolleston is part of the wider Christchurch metropolitan area. Shortly after departure, we leave the main south line, which continues to Dunedin, and head west on the Midland Line. I've finally made it to the top of the queue. Here's a closer look at the breakfast options. I choose the combo, which includes a savoury item and a hot drink. Here's some of the other items available. That sound indicates an audio commentary is about to begin. I go for a feta and spring onion muffin, which comes with butter, although it's not really needed. And I choose a latte as my drink. The muffin is quite moist. Delicious! Because the train doesn't always have mobile reception, card payment is not always available, so I recommend having some cash on hand. In the distance is the Fonterra Dairy Factory, which features the world's largest milk powder dryer. We're now passing through the village of Sheffield, home to about 200 people. Shortly, we'll see some carriages owned by the Midland Rail Heritage Trust, formed in 2004 to preserve the locos and rolling stock that worked the Midland Railway. leave Springfield now. After we leave here we head into some of our more talked about parts of scenery heading over our four viaducts and around by the Waimakari River. The Māori, Waimakari means cold rushing waters. For much of the year it's no exaggeration. It's 150 kilometres long, starts its journey high up in the Southern Alps and it reaches the sea near Kaipo which is a small town just north of Christchurch. Just a reminder if you head to the outdoor viewing deck, people, body parts, Behind the confines of those barriers, tunnels of trees sneak upon us really quickly. Do rug up warm, folks. It's fully air conditioned out there. You've got to love Kiwi humour. Here's a quick look at our schedule. Now the scenery starts heating up. The section of line between here and Arthur's Pass is considered a masterpiece of railway engineering. Many passengers head to the viewing car. The Waimakariri River Gorge comes into view. We enter the first of 17 tunnels and cross our first major viaduct, Patterson's Creek. There are five viaducts on the Midland Line. This area, Otarama, was the end of the line for some time. It was a popular picnic excursion destination in the mid 1890s.
we enter a series of tunnels. The Waimakariri is a braided river. Braided rivers are rare. They only occur with a specific combination of climate and geology, which allows the river to form ever-changing and highly dynamic braided channels across a wide, gravelly riverbed. New Zealand is a braided river hotspot. The braided channels are formed of sediment and gravel carried from the Southern Alps. You might notice the yellow flowers. These are a mix of gorse and broom. They're pests brought in the early 1800s by English settlers. We're now traversing the highest viaduct on the line, the famous staircase, 72 metres above the river. Here's a better view of it. And another perspective. And one final view. In 1885, the New Zealand Midland Railway Company was contracted by the government to build a railway across to the west coast and on to Nelson. This involved 376 kilometres of railway to be completed within 10 years. This was unrealistic, given insufficient funding and ignorance of the conditions by the company's London directors, and the venture ran out of money within the decade. After much legal argument, the government took over and work was resumed in 1898 by the Public Works Department. The section of line we're now traversing was described as rough by the government engineer. On westbound journeys such as ours, the best views are located on the right-hand side of the train. You can't choose a seat when booking online, but you can contact Great Journeys of New Zealand afterwards to put in a seating request. That is some fast flowing water. This is the final viaduct on our route, but don't worry, there's plenty more scenery to come. We reach the high plains of Craigieburn. I've avoided the open air car so far because other passengers mentioned it was packed, so I'm hoping it's quietened down a bit. Muffin and hot drink combo. You can have an, a food item and a hot drink over a store. The crew are promoting some of the meals available. The open air car is located at the very front of the train. I finally made it. So compared to the Northern Explorer or Coastal Pacific, the Transalpine the open air car is much busier. Here's how this area can look in winter. You can spot snow on some of the distant peaks. We're maintaining a decent speed. The Transalpine takes just under five hours to cover 230 kilometres, giving us an average speed of 48 kilometres per hour. But of course, this is a scenic train, so there's no rush. Cass was the end of the line for a number of years while the Midland Line was under construction. And at that time, Cass had a population of about 800 people. 
Today, it has an official resident population of one. Once again, we're following the ice-fed waters of the Waimakariri River. This bridge provides access to Canterbury's largest high country farm, spanning 40,000 hectares. Here's a view of the bridge we've just crossed. There was once a railway station here, but now there's just this passing loop. Passing loops are needed in case we need to cross one of the many coal trains that ply this route. You can clearly see that this is a narrow gauge railway. We follow the Bailey River to Arthur's Pass, where we'll stop for about 10 minutes. We have stopped short to attach some locomotives to the front, so this is not the Arthur's Pass stop. Once we move up to the platform, that'll be your one chance for a stretch of the legs if you're continuing on to Moana or Graver, but it's very important that you do listen carefully, as people often get left behind. So if you are continuing on to Moana or Graver, just down the platform area, use the toilets on the train. There's no toilets at the platform here. Uh, there's no rubbish bins either as it does poison the wildlife, so uh, just leave any rubbish at your seat. We'll collect it up once we leave Oterra. The village of Arthur's Pass is located about five kilometres south of the mountain pass after which it is named. This is a popular base for exploring Arthur's Pass National Park, established in 1929. 
it was the first national park on New Zealand's South Island. Some passengers go hiking here and will rejoin the eastbound Transalpine in about six hours time. A lot of tour groups get off here. An extra two locos have been added to the front of our train and another two at the rear for additional safety as we are about to enter an 8.5 kilometre tunnel on an extreme grade. The backup locos mean the train can exit the tunnel in either direction in case of a loco failure or emergency. This car is almost empty now the tour groups have left. We're about to enter one of the longest tunnels in New Zealand, the Oteira Tunnel. The open air viewing car is closed for this section because of the diesel fumes. The cafe also closes temporarily. The line in the tunnel has an average grade of 1 in 33. This means for every 33 metres we travel, we descend a metre. This is equivalent to a 3% grade, steep in railway terms. We'll descend 244 metres while in the tunnel. Construction took 15 years and was interrupted by World War I. Opening in 1923, it was the longest tunnel in the British Empire at the time of construction. Now seems a good time to check out the toilets. We'll visit the toilet in the cafe car. Hi, and welcome to one of the accessible bathrooms. There's a changing table, a retention toilet, a basin, and hand dryer. There's also a spot for rubbish. The button is to request crew assistance. The toilet was kept clean throughout the journey. We emerge into the sunlight. The Oteira Tunnel marks the transition from Canterbury to the west coast. Sometimes called the Great Divide or Main Divide, the mountains under which the Oteira Tunnel travels stand in the way of the weather. As a result, the weather is typically wetter on the west side. Here, the Rolleston River, closest to us, joins the Oteira River, and you will have noticed the rivers here flow west towards the Tasman Sea. We're coming into Oteira, which for most of its life was a railway town, running the railway that kept the coal flowing from the west coast coal fields to Christchurch and the rest of New Zealand. We've almost halved our elevation in the 14 kilometres since Arthur's Pass. The train makes a technical stop here so that the extra locos added to the front and rear of the train can be removed. Here are some of the locomotive engineers. A few minutes later and we're moving again. Oteira station dates from 1900. The onboard cafe has reopened. Here are some of the alcoholic beverages on offer. And this is the train manager's office. We follow the Oteira River downstream. I decide to complement the views with a coffee.
The Oteira has now joined a larger river, the Tira Macau. Back to the open air car, which is a lot quieter now. Lake Pauerua sits on the Australia Pacific Plate boundary, with granite rock from the Australian Plate to the west and meta sedimentary rocks from the Pacific Plate to the east. The Crooked River flows into the largest lake in the west coast region of New Zealand, Lake Brunner. In the distance we catch our first glimpses of Lake Brunner. And now the lake comes into full view. As you might imagine, fishing is a popular pastime here and the lake is home to good stocks of wild brown trout. We're coming into the small town of Moana. Lake Brunner was created in the last ice age by a spur of the Tiramacau Glacier, which split from the main glacier and flowed north either side of Mount Tekinga. How about that view? We're running about 10 minutes ahead of schedule. There's a brief stop here. Although the town has a very small permanent population, there are about 300 holiday homes. It's easy to see why. The original station building was destroyed by fire in 1926. The replacement building was built in the same year and is heritage listed. As you can see, the lake is also popular for water sports.
we leave the lake behind. We're following the Arnold River, an outflow of Lake Brunner. Time for lunch. There's still plenty of food available, unlike my trip on the Northern Explorer, where they sold out of all hot meals and sandwiches. I'm back at my seat to eat. This is a kumara and cashew pie. Kumara is a sweet potato brought to New Zealand by early Maori settlers. And some sparkling water. Kiwis make great pies, although this one is not as good as some I've had in New Zealand. Heating a pie in the microwave is never the best. The filling's a bit hot. More glimpses of the Arnold River. This is a meat processing plant. Ansco is one of New Zealand's largest exporters. The plant processes beef and lamb. It looks like they use rail transport as well, which is great to see. The crew announces the cafe will close in 20 minutes. That's New Zealand's State Highway 7, which also crosses the Southern Alps towards Christchurch, but via a more northerly route than we took. There's a rail junction here with the Westport Line, which is primarily used to haul coal. We'll stay on the Midland Line, heading for the West Coast. Gentlemen, just passing through an area we know as Stillwater. This is where we do close down the cafe and bar services. I'd like to thank you for visiting the cafe today. Currently running on time, so we should be arriving in to Greymouth at five past one this, evening, this afternoon. Thank you. We follow the Grey River towards the Tasman Sea. We're now close to the site of New Zealand's deadliest mining disaster. An explosion deep in a bunker mine in 1896 killed all 65 miners below ground. Here's a closer look at the site. There's a memorial here for Thomas Brunner, an English-born surveyor and explorer known for his exploration of the West Coast. Finally, I've got the place to myself. So how much does this trip cost? A standard one-way fare in winter between Christchurch and Greymouth is 189 New Zealand dollars. At the time of travel, there was only one class of travel, Scenic Class. Kiwi Rail has now introduced a premium class, Scenic Plus, which costs a lot more but includes restaurant quality food prepared on board and drinks. If you'd like me to make a review of Scenic Plus, let me know in the comments. Fares during the summer season, the most popular time to travel, are slightly pricier in both classes. So does the Transalpine live up to its reputation? Yes, the scenery is spectacular and it's a wonderful way to spend half a day. However, New Zealand's other long distance trains, the Northern Explorer and the Coastal Pacific, have an advantage. They're both less well known, so expectations for both are more easily exceeded. You could also say the Transalpine is a victim of its own success. 
The number of passengers on the train between Christchurch and Arthur's Pass resulted in large queues for the cafe and a very busy viewing car, whereas the other two trains don't seem to have these issues. Of course, once we left Arthur's Pass, there was plenty of space. All three trains offer something different, so I'd recommend taking each of them if you can. From May to September, the Transalpine is running a long weekend service for winter. It will resume a daily service in late September ahead of summer. This is a short branch line used for hauling coal. Some goats. These piers were part of the original Rapahoe line that meant coal trains had to come into Greymouth before heading east. This is a span of the original railway bridge dating from 1898 and which was replaced in 2006. The railway station is located at the eastern end of Greymouth, near the Grey River. The station building dates from 1897 and is heritage listed. Australians will notice that supermarket in the background looks very familiar, except in Australia it's called Woolworths. Greymouth is the largest town in the region. There's a tourist shop in the station, as well as car hire desks. We arrive about 15 minutes ahead of schedule. A final look at the seating. The Transalpine will stable in yards a little further south of here. It will make its eastbound journey back to Christchurch in about an hour. A lot of people pick up rental cars here to travel down the west coast. It's a trip well worth making. Hiking on a glacier has to be one of the most incredible things I've done. So here I am in Greymouth after a very scenic, comfortable and enjoyable trip aboard the Transalpine. If I'm brutally honest, I would say I think that the Coastal Pacific and the Northern Explorer are underrated. Don't get me wrong, this is a great train, but I think those two are hard to beat. Here's the Transalpine on its return journey. In my next video, more narrow gauge action. But this time in tropical far north Queensland, as we take a trip on the Coranda Scenic Railway. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out. Hope to see you then.